Let's go for it, guys. Let's go. So we're in Acts chapter 15, and this is a pretty epic moment, okay? This is the Jerusalem Council. And uh, this is something that's really easy just to read past if you're, you know, just reading through the book of Acts. And I highly recommend that you do that again if you have time. You know, it'll take you maybe an hour and a half to sit and read through the whole book of Acts. Okay, so it's a, just a good thing for you to do to jump back in. But uh, this uh, is an epic moment in church history. And I'm going to tell you why, and then we're going to dive in a little bit and see why that actually is a big deal. Okay, but this is the moment where the early church started to really realize and grapple with, actually, Jesus has come and made a way for every person to enter in who just believes. It's not about all the things that you have to do. It's not about a bunch of religious stuff. It's not about the way that we've always done it, even the way that the holy God of our entire history before this point has asked us to worship him. And we stand in this grace, you know, like as, as an evangelical, free Christian church. You know, we stand in this. We're like, oh, yeah, salvation by grace through faith. It like rolls off our tongue. But this is the moment, just so you know, where the church started to, to realize this, okay? So a little bit of history here, just a little bit of history, just so we're catching up because it's been a few weeks, okay? Um, the, the bulk of the early part of Acts is Peter and the other apostles' ministries, okay? It's these guys who are walking with Jesus. Holy Spirit falls on them in Jerusalem, and then the gospel starts to go out, and with that, persecution starts to go out, but the apostles pretty much stay in Jerusalem, and, and it's multiplying, okay? But it's just multiplying among the Jews. And then shortly before Christmas, we, we read about this story where Peter went to pray for a sick lady, and then while he's there, he has a vision and God is saying, everything that I've called clean now, don't call unclean. And then some guys knock on the door right as he's in the middle of the vision. And it's these servants of a Gentile called Cornelius. Now, now you got to get me, okay? Because we're all Gentiles. We're all like, or most of us probably in this room, okay? We're all like, yeah, the Gentiles. But to the Jews, up to this entire point, I mean the entire Old Testament, the Jews are the blessed people of God. They're the promised ones. All the prophets have come to them. No one else. And the, now Jesus has come, and the Holy Spirit has come and is moving in the Jews. And they're like, yeah, see, we're the ones. We knew it. It was prophesied forever. We're the ones who get to have the promises of God. But this, this crazy thing happens where this Gentile leader, Cornelius, who fears God, he has heard about Jesus, but he doesn't fully understand, he sends for Peter. Peter's had this vision. So he comes, preaches the gospel to this group of Gentiles, and the strangest thing happens. They believe, and the Holy Spirit falls upon them, just like it happened to the Jews. And Peter, he's kind of like, wow, that was kind of crazy. And it's almost like he just like, you know, leaves, and he goes back home, and he's like, that was weird. Anyway, back to my ministry with, with the Jews. It's kind of what happens, okay? But in the midst of this time, now, Paul has gotten saved. And Barnabas takes Paul, and they start traveling together, and they go from city to city in Asia Minor, and it's all Gentile cities. And everywhere that they go, that they start explaining the good news about Jesus, Gentiles, pagans, I mean, they worship idols. They do horrible practices. These guys suddenly are struck with the hope of the gospel and they start to believe. And the church starts to explode. And that's when we catch up in Acts chapter 15. So let's read a few verses here. So Acts chapter 15, verse 1, says this. But some men came from Judea, so they came from Jerusalem, and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. So Paul and Barnabas have preached the gospel. Hey, Jesus died on a cross and rose again to pay for your sins. And you can look at him and believe. And you can be saved. And then some Jews come from Judea. And they say, yeah, yeah, what Paul and Barnabas are saying is cool. But you also have to become Jewish. Okay, guys? So you have to get circumcised. And you have to actually keep all the law of Moses. If we go on to verse 5, it says this. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it's necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So the Jews show up and they are being tough. 
tough on these new believers. Now, remember, these new believers, they don't know anything, okay? They, they didn't grow up Jews. They didn't hear all the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They just grew up worshiping their pagan gods, their, their pagan culture, the whole deal. And then Paul and Barnabas told them about the good news of Jesus, and they believed. And the Holy Spirit confirmed it. And they're speaking in tongues, and they're ministering, and sharing with one another, and there's so much joy, and then someone shows up and ruins the party, okay? Now, for any men in the room, you know, someone telling you you have to be circumcised would definitely ruin the party a little bit, and then, you know, saying, hey, you actually have to keep all the law of Moses. You're like, well, I, I don't even know the law. I mean, there's so much of it. I mean, look, that's like the law of Moses right there. Oh, my goodness. What am I going to do? And so a big dissension erupts. And that's what causes this Jerusalem council to happen. So Paul and Barnabas are sent back to Jerusalem. And they start to recount what has happened. And they all are debating and disagreeing it. And they're trying to figure out, okay, so these Gentiles are getting saved. What do we do? And they're debating it back and forth. And then Peter stands up and has this epic speech, okay? And he, it's like... He's gone back to his ministry with the Jews, but then he's hearing all these guys talking now, and he's realizing the gospel is going out all over Asia Minor, and he, he goes, okay, he stands up and he says this. Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's talking about Cornelius. And then verse 8 says this, and God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Verse 11, we have it here. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. He's making this statement. Wait a second. Guys, we're believing now that the new day has come. That everything that the prophets prophesied has come. That actually will be saved only through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Just like them. And if you can throw up verse 10 on here, it's actually pretty interesting. Because he references this. He references verse 10. Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? This is wild. Guys, I'm doing this crazy thing right now. Um, I follow this guy on Instagram, okay, and he's, the, he's the, one of the teaching pastors at Hillsong Church, and he's doing this thing for the whole first month of 2020 called The Shred. Has anyone heard of this? Anyone heard of it? A couple people, okay? So The Shred is where you try and read through the entire Bible in one month. When I first heard of it in December, I was like, that is ridiculous, and then something in me just was like, but I kind of want to do it. And so I've started doing it, and you know, it's, it, I've, I've done it for 18 days so far. It's pretty crazy that I've been able to hold it down. I, like, I'm up late at night, a lot of nights, like, Jenny, I've got to finish. And so she goes to bed, and I finish reading, okay? But what has stuck out to me so far, over and over, I'm in Jeremiah, okay? Over and over and over through the Old Testament, we see God saying, hey, I, I want to bless you, so here's the law. Would you keep it? And the people say, yes, we will keep it. And then they fall away. And then God, you know, there's some consequences. But then he gives them grace, brings it back. Hey, guys, if you'll just keep the law, I want to bless you. They say, we will keep it. And then they fall away. Over and over and over. Cycle after cycle after cycle of God giving grace again because they've broken the law over and over and over. And that's what Peter is saying. He's saying, guys, we could never keep the law. Our fathers couldn't keep the law. The promise was for the day when God would make a way so that we didn't even have to keep the law because he would fulfill the requirements of his law, right? Now, you might be thinking, okay, why is this a big deal, Johnny? You know, like, okay, the law and the prophets, I know, but we have the New Testament, we have Jesus, all that kind of stuff. Well, I want to tell you, we have this same conversation all the time today, okay, all the time. And uh, th there's kind of a couple of categories that it tends to come up, come up in. If you ever share the gospel with someone, have you ever had this? Where you try and tell someone about Jesus, and they're like, well, yeah, you know, I, I'm a pretty good person. I, get, I give to charity, you know. And I'm, I'm part of the Rotary Club, and, um, 
yeah, I, I mean, I, I haven't divorced my wife yet or anything like that. I don't steal, so I'm, I'm good, you know. I'm good. I, I, you know, your Jesus thing, that's cool, but I don't really need Jesus, right? This is totally for them because this is where Peter is saying, hey, you know what? Actually, to be close to God, you have to keep it all. You don't get to be just a good person. You don't get to be, and maybe there's some of you in this room today, you know, maybe you've been part of this church even for a while, and you're like, I'm a good person. I think I'm good with God because I'm doing good. This is Paul's, or this is Peter saying, you know what, it doesn't matter if you're good, actually. In terms of your salvation, being good, you can never be good enough. Every single one of us have sinned. And fallen away from God. And even one little tiny white lie. And you deserve eternally to be separated from God. Paul says to the good person. Or Peter says to the good person. He says, hey, you are saved only through the grace of the Lord. But then there's there's another club. And I've definitely belonged to both of these clubs at different times in my life. Okay, The second club is like the Jesus Plus Club, okay? It's like the the Disney Plus Club, you know? It's like Jesus and something else. He's like, yeah, you know, you can be saved, just just say the sinner's prayer, and then come to Bible study and read through the whole Bible in a month and show up at prayer meeting and do all these other things, and then you'll be saved. And actually, this is like what almost for all of history people tend to do. You know, we put these yokes on ourselves or on other people. We put these things that they have to do in addition to believing in Jesus. And Peter's saying, no, 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 guys, it's not Jesus and something. It's not Jesus plus Bible study. It's not Jesus plus play in the worship band or preach on Sunday from time to time or Jesus plus give to the poor or anything. He's like, no, in terms of salvation, the only way you're saved, the only way is by looking at Jesus and believing in his grace. There is no other way. And this is a huge, huge deal. Because up to this point, this is a group of Jews, right? And they have been stoically trying so hard to keep the law. And they realize, actually, you're right, Peter. None of us were ever able to. And we can't keep the law. And do you know what? This is why the gospel is good news. It's because, actually, all of us in the the darkest places of our hearts, the middle of the night, Holy Spirit lie detector test, if you're actually asked, do you know that you're a sinner? You know that I'm a sinner, (laughs) You know, that actually, if someone could look into the depths of my soul or the depths of your soul, they'd think, man, I, I don't really want to be around this guy. He's kind of creepy, right? I mean, I'm serious, guys, right? I mean, we all laugh because we just, we know it's true. And actually, the gospel is good news for people that know it's way too hard to be holy. It's impossible even. Man, I, I, I need saving grace, I need a good savior. I need a God who did all the work, made all the way for me. See, the the gospel is really bad news for the proud. It's really bad news for those who think that they're healthy. But it's really, really good news, news for those who know that they're sick. Right? I want to tell you today, by the way, if, if you're in Livingstone's church, maybe this is your first time here, you've only come a few times, you're like, wow, these people are so amazing, and I don't know if I belong, I want to tell you, if you are sick, and you are broken, and you're messed up, then you belong here, okay? Because that's, that's who we are. That's who we are. We're a bunch of sick, messed up people that God has been gracious to, and he has poured out his love and his goodness upon and this is where, you know, it rolls off our, tongue, off our tongue, salvation by grace through faith, but let it never really roll off our tongue. Let it be, oh, I am saved by the grace of God through my simple faith in believing him. You know, I met Jesus when I was 17 years old. When I was 17 years old, I was a big sinner, and I knew I was a big sinner. And the gospel, when I realized what really the gospel about what was about, it was such good news. It was such good news. Because I had screwed up so bad. I just want to read you this verse. I don't have it up here. But just listen to these words. Because 
Paul then, you know, the, 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 the early leaders of the church have this revelation and he expands on it for us. It's Romans chapter 3, verse 20 and on. It says this, for, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes only knowledge of sin. I mean, trying to keep the law, you just figure out how much of a creep you really are, right? But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Oh man, the, the sinner broken soul drinks those words in. You can drink them in today. You can drink them in today. If you're, if you're a broken sinner, come to Jesus. He has grace for you. He has grace for you. This is, this is the whole thing we talk about in Living Stones over and over, right? It's living from a victory instead of for a victory. Instead of me trying so hard to do everything so that God will finally accept me, it's going, wow, I'm already accepted by God. So now I'm going to live from the riches of his love in that place. Well, it's an amazing moment, you know, and, and they have this revelation as a group of people sitting there. And so... They start to think about, well, well, what do we do in response then? Like, how do we respond for this, this dear church of Gentiles that's up there in Antioch and somebody's giving them a bunch of bad news? We need to give them some good news. So they wait on God. And as they're waiting on God, James speaks up. And he has wisdom and he reminds them of, of how God actually prophesied through the prophets that it wouldn't just be the Jews that are blessed, but actually the Gentiles would be blessed too. And they're all like, oh yeah, God wanted this forever. He wanted the whole world to be blessed by Jesus. So they write a letter to them and they write actually a pretty low bar. And I, I just want to read this to you. Um, I forget which verses I got. Was it verse 29 onwards? Maybe it was earlier. I'll, I'll just read it to you, and you guys can catch up. What's the earliest verse you have there? 28. There you go, okay? They write this letter. They say, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Farewell. Isn't that great? Now, now, pause for a second. Imagine this is you. Imagine you're a Jewish leader in the church. I mean, imagine you're even just a leader in Living Stones today, and you heard some pagans on the other side of the island. You know, they're a helo side. Pagans. I don't know. They got saved, okay? And you're trying to figure out, how do we guide these guys in following God? You know, we'd have a big meeting together. We'd probably come up with our 10 points or our 15 points or our 38 points. Follow these things, guys. You're going to be good. No, no. They come with some super simple stuff. What are they basically saying, okay? I'm going to give you two simple points. Abstain from what's been sacrificed to idols, from blood, and what has been strangled. Okay, this is pretty simple. This is actually about idolatry. This is about idol worship. You know, these guys were Gentiles. They have their gods of wood and stone and gold and all that kind of stuff. And they would sacrifice to them. And a lot of the pagan practices had a lot of stuff to do with blood. But actually, blood, God said since the beginning... Even before Abraham and stuff, he said the, that there was life in the blood and never to drink blood, right? So it wasn't even in the law of Moses. This is like long before. And they said, actually, all that idol worship stuff to do with blood and it's filthy. Let's just say, guys, stay away from worshiping idols. Don't even go there. You have one God to worship now. You don't need to worship anyone else. Okay? And then they said, stay away from sexual immorality. Okay? This is like morally, just avoid that whole category. Now, it might be easy for us to sit here and think, well, that, that's pretty easy. You know, I, I don't have, we don't do any idol worship here. I, don't, I can't remember seeing anyone in anyone's house recently. And then sexual immorality, that's no big deal too. You know, I'm married, I've got kids, like easy for me to stay away from. Let me just break it down to you because it actually is a little bit convicting as we go there. Because we don't necessarily have like idols of wood and stone and all that kind of stuff in our day, but you better believe me, 
there's plenty of other idols in our lives, right? Things that we would tend to worship equal to or above God. And someone who is super wise, I heard this quote once, I forget who it was, but they, they said, and I read it somewhere or heard it somewhere, they said, you can tell the health of the heart of man by the value of the thing they value most. Okay, I'll say it again. You can tell the health of the heart of man by the value of the thing that you value most. So when you actually stop and think about it, I mean, I had to do some repenting before the Lord this morning as I was preparing for you guys, okay? Because I realized there's some things in my life that actually, if you were to look from the outside, maybe it'd be a little bit hard to tell if I valued God the most or if I valued these things the most. Not even bad things, right? Things like my wife and my kids, my family, things that are awesome that God has given me but should never be put before God, right? That, that's easy to see how that could be idol worship in our day, right? What about this? What about money and stuff? I mean, we live in a time of unprecedented wealth. Seriously, like, like the world has never seen before. And, and you and I, you know, you might feel like, well, I don't have that much money, Johnny, or I'm in a little bit of debt or anything. If you just have three meals a day, you're automatically ahead of half the world's population, okay? So, I mean, unprecedented wealth. It's so easy to think if I just had more money or if I just could, you know, build that new house or whatever, and I'm saying that because we're working on building a new house, okay? I'm speaking to me. Then I would be good. Then I'll be secure rather than saying, actually, no, my wealth and my security is heaven and it's God, right? What about this? You know, I, my parents live in Kansas City. Anyone know what today is to do with Kansas City? Chiefs game. Starts right now, actually. Like right now is the Chiefs game, okay? And so I'm pretty excited about it. But I want to ask you and I want to ask me. I was thinking about this this morning. If somebody walks in and sees me watching the Chiefs game and sees me cheering as they score and as they win, and then they walked into church on Sunday and they watched me worship God, would they think that God was more important than the chiefs or less important than the chiefs by the extravagance of my worship to my team? Just throwing it out there, guys, okay? It's real. Can we be real for a second? Idol worship. Abstain from worshiping idols. Run from that stuff. You have a new master. You have a new God. Worship him only. And then sexual in immorality, you know, it, in our day, unfortunately, sexual immorality is kind of the joke. I mean, like pretty much every comedy or anything, you know, like it's, it, it is the joke. It's like funny now um, to, to laugh at immorality, right? But actually, I, th I think it's kind of significant that this is the one moral sin that they make sure to mention, and I just want to throw it out there to you. I'm not the theologian, so you can take it up with Ryan next week if you want to, okay? But I want to throw it out there to you that I think in the scriptures, actually, sexual immorality is a bigger deal than a lot of other sins. Because Paul talks about it. It's in 1 Corinthians. He talks about how, in fact, I actually have it written. Let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians 6. I don't think I put this up overhead, but let me read it to you because it, it actually... I was reading this verse, I found it this morning, and I was like, wow, this, this talks about both of those things. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 to 20. It says this, But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside his body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with the price. So glorify God with your body. The, the apostles in the early church made a bigger deal about sexual immorality than other sins. And I think part of it is because it profanes what is meant to be a beautiful image of Christ in the church. Right? The marriage bed and morality in sexuality is meant to demonstrate the love that Christ has for his church and the bride's response to him. So they're like, hey guys, if there's one thing we're going to give you, flee from this one thing. 
You know, it, it's interesting for some of us this morning, you know, like m- maybe you're sitting here and, and you're, you're not convicted about any of this stuff, and that's okay. But immorality doesn't just mean like you're having an adulterous affair. It could mean that, you know. It could mean you're sleeping with your girlfriend or you're just going too far, right? Or it could mean actually that you're in a cycle of pornography. You know, pornography didn't exist in the early church. They wanted a pornographic experience. They had to go to a prostitute. We just can turn on our computers, right? So, you know, for other people, sexual immorality it isn't so much about the lust of the act, but it's the idea of being with that other person or something, right? There, Paul's like, no, don't have any of this. Honor God with your body. And so maybe there is a moment for some of us today deep down where you're just like, hey, actually, okay, God, you're speaking to me. I need to stop some things. I, mean, I need to make some life transitions. But, you know, that's all that they set upon the early church. It's all that they told these Gentile believers. And why was that? Well, the Holy Spirit had, had fallen upon them, and they trusted the Holy Spirit to continue to do what had happened in them. See, God promised through the prophets that one day, it's in Jer- Jeremiah 31, and it's beautiful. He promised that one day when, when the Messiah came, God would write the law on everyone's hearts. And he put a new mind and a new heart in them. So everyone from the heart would now want to obey God. And this is what happens when you get saved. When you look at Jesus and believe, he starts to transform you from the inside out so that now my desires become God's desires. My heart becomes God's heart. I just want to leave you with a few things to think about and pray about, and then we're going to be done here, okay? And we're going to leave some room. If you want to pray, you want to respond to the gospel, there's always people here who are going to pray with you, okay? And, and we love that. But uh, this was the epic moment where the early church realized, hey, wait a minute, salvation is by grace alone through faith. So how do we know? How do we know that we're walking in this grace gospel that is so rich and so free and so amazing and not walking in still trying to do it and still trying to figure it out and work it out on our own? Well, I, I spent some time this morning just praying into this and had a short list. These are not the only reasons you would know, but these are things that can help your heart figure out the difference, okay? And just help your heart understand, God, am I really living in your free gift of grace? Or actually, is there more that I need to receive? And these were ones that were convicting to me, okay? So it's like reading Johnny Gillespie's personal diary for a minute, okay? But... um, Seven different signs you might know, actually, I, I'm working too hard for my own salvation. The first one is if you are given to performance, okay? And this is where you feel good when you're doing well instead of feeling good because God has forgiven you, right? I used to always be in this cycle, I mean, early in my Christian walk, where I would feel amazing and feel like I could be close to God if I wasn't sinning, and then if I stumbled in some kind of sin, then I'd feel terrible and walk around with my head low and like in shame for a few days, feel like God couldn't talk to me and I was in the doghouse again, okay? That is a great sign that you're walking in legalism, that you are walking under the law, that you are trying still to do the Jesus plus deal. And Jesus wants to set you free of that today, okay? Now, now let me be clear, it's not to say that you can just do whatever you want, No, like the Gospels are full of that, and the Apostles are so clear. Like grace doesn't give us a license to sin. Grace makes us not want to sin anymore, right? But if you are given to performance, it's a sign. It's a sign, okay? And Jesus wants to give you his grace today and set you free with the free gift of his love and his salvation today. Okay, another one. If I struggle to be forgiven, so I walk around living in shame about what I've done either recently or in the distant past. You're like, I could never tell anyone about that thing that I've done. They would never let me back in the doors of this church again. If only they knew, and you're constantly worried that someone might find out. Instead of just recognizing, actually, I'm washed. I'm forgiven blood of Jesus has cleansed me, and the final word has been spoken by him on the cross. It is finished. It's finished. It's buried. Third one that I had is joylessness. If you don't have joy in your day-to-day life in the gospel, now let me be clear. Life is hard. 
Plenty of bad stuff happens to good people. I just read a few days ago through all of Ecclesiastes, which is basically, if you sum up the book, why does bad stuff happen to good people and good stuff happen to bad people, right? If you are, if you are enduring life, but you're in Christ, there should be joy and salvation and the hope of a gospel. But if you are living under the burden of life, and it's really hard for you to have joy in your day-to-day life. It's just a sign. Maybe. Maybe there's something you can receive of the grace of God today. Maybe there's a humbling of yourself that can happen. And he can give you fresh joy today. Okay, fourth one. If you're a little bit macho, if you're a little bit like, I've got this. I can do it. I'm not going to sin again. I'm going to figure this thing out. I'm going to be that good person. Look at me. I'm doing so well. If that's you, instead of being like, Jesus, you have to take care of this because I'm like one moment without the Holy Spirit away from utterly destroying my life and utterly sinning against you, right? That's the grace-filled place. The grace-filled place is, yeah, I was a sinner. Now I am a saint, and without the Holy Spirit, there's no way this will maintain, right? Oh, but with the Holy Spirit, there's life abundant day by day. I can't do it. I don't have it. You have it, Jesus. Fifth one, you make deals with God. God, if I do this, then you will do this. Instead of, Jesus, you've already done so much, I just want to respond to you, right? No more deals. The deal's already been done. It's like literally, I just got $10 million in the bank, and so everything that I could try and do to bless God back is like only a drop in the bucket. I already got the $10 million, right? If you're making deals with God, God, if, if I stop this sin, will you bless me in this way? Well, that's, that's you going back to the law, buddy. It's time for you to go to grace. It's time for you to receive the gift that only God could give you. Okay, two more, two more. Comparison. You know, comparison can manifest in a couple of different ways. It can either be like, you know, the proud way of like, I'm so glad I'm not like that person, you know, like the, the guy walks into the back of church, you know, maybe he's been living on the streets for a little bit, you know, and his clothes are a little bit worn out, and he's a little disheveled, you're like, man, I'm so glad that I'm not like that guy, okay? That's one way comparison can manifest. The other way it manifests, anyone ever had this, or is this just Johnny Gillespie? Because I've definitely had this. That guy doesn't love Jesus that much. He's totally faking it, <laughs> totally fake. There's got to be sin in his closet. Back, there's a skeleton, I know it. I'm sitting here in church watching you guys worship, judging you in comparison, okay? I, I guess I'm the only one. That's okay, it's okay. I might be the worst sinner of all. If I'm not asked to preach back again, I know why now. Instead of, instead of we're, we're all the same before God. We are all sinners utterly broken before God that then Jesus in his grace came and transformed us with the regeneration of the Holy Spirit and made us into his saints. And now we come, you know, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, rich or poor, male nor female. To him, we are your bride. We are saved. You have won us, right? No more comparison. And then the last one is the us versus them. Others have to behave before they belong rather than actually there's an open door for anyone, you know? You, you've got to deal with your mess, buddy, before you could come. You have to stop sinning before you could come rather than the broken sinner before the cross. And again, maybe that's not you. It definitely has been me. If those things are things that are in your life, then there is more grace, more goodness, more life, more abundance for you as you open your heart to Jesus. And I just want to finish with this amazing verse. You know, these are verses that we all know, but these are ones that we can drink in as truth from the gospel. Let's just drink this one in. It's Galatians 2, verse 20 right here. It says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to give you an invitation today, okay? And I'm not going to make you stand up and come to the front on your own or whatever. We're going to have people here to pray for you in a minute. I'm going to pray in close, okay? And then we're going to dismiss and everyone's going to go out. But the prayer team will be here. I want to give you an invitation. If you've never before fully trusted Jesus, like in him alone, for the salvation of your soul, 
because of his grace and his kindness, and you want to today. You can start today. And I just want to invite you, you can either turn to the neighbor that's sitting next to you, I mean, pretty much anyone in this church, they, they'd love to pray with you, okay? Or you can come to the prayer team at the front, and you can say, hey, that's me, and I want to respond to the gospel today, and we would love to pray with you. And I just want to give you that invitation. If you are so tired of trying, if you are so tired of trying on your own to, to, to measure up to God's standard, I just want to give you that good news of the gospel again today. You can't make it happen. So why not give up and let God and his grace pour out upon your life, okay? And then there's other ones of you who may, you know, you may just realize and recognize in your heart, man, I, I trust Jesus for my salvation, but I, re I recognize there's some Jesus plus going on. And again, that was me this morning about 6 a.m., you know, repenting on my knees in my living room of Jesus plus and going back to Jesus. I'm just so grateful for the good news of your gospel. We want to pray for you too, Okay. Because it's actually only a humble, grace-filled, broken people that God can use anyway. So we just want to invite you to pray, okay? So the prayer team, you, prayer team, you can come on up. And everyone else, let's just pray together now. And then we'll dismiss from there. Jesus, I want to thank you for your gospel. I want to thank you that your gospel is so good. And it was so costly for you to die on a cross and be risen to life. So that we could be saved and set free and redeemed. And God, we can never measure up to your holiness, but you can. And so we look to you, and we're thankful, Lord, that all we have to do is look at you and believe. And God, I want to thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, that you come in on the inside, and you start to set us free from sin, and you start to make us holy and like you. And Holy Spirit, I want to ask you that all across this room, you would lead us to be a people, Living Stones Church, that is full of the sick who have been saved and redeemed and set free just by you, Jesus. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.